All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon, well, this evening here in Chicago, it's this afternoon. Um, we had a great get together last night with our LA musicians, our Dennis Wick L Los Angeles musician meetup. If you want to check that out, um, you can go to our new Dennis Wick uh, Facebook group, Team Dennis Wick, and uh, the early view of that video is up and ready to go. Um, today is our London meetup. So if you thought you were joining the Chicago meeting, that's in a few hours. <laughs> but stick around. For those of you coming for the London meetup, um, welcome to, to uh, all of our attendees and welcome to all, all our musicians. Um, I'm excited because I'm obviously, I, I work for the North American distributor, so I don't know a lot of these musicians yet. So I will be getting introduced to a lot of them as well as you. So we'll be discussing the London scene and many of you have sent me questions on um, specifically regarding COVID. So, and, and kind of what, what we're looking at after COVID as far as musicians and also surviving during COVID as creative people. So there's a lot of great questions that we're going to try to cover all of them. We're going to start off just kind of talking about the scene a little bit. We've got musicians from um, classical orchestral, pit orchestra musicians, um, jazz, uh, early music. So we've got a lot of different um, experience, a, a wealth of experience in this group that we can draw from. Um, just a quick couple notes to panelists or to attendees. Um, if you would like to continue discussing this, any subjects we bring up here, um, or we have to cut things short because of time, you can continue the discussion by joining, as I mentioned earlier, our Facebook group, Team Dennis Quick. I've got a link here for you. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat to all of you. Um, oh, will be. <laughs> and also, if you'd like to connect a little bit more with Dennis Wick products, we have the Dennis Wick app. It's got, uh, it's got information on all of our artists and uh, products. Any new product information is on there. There's video clinics. There's a Dennis Wick radio station where you can listen to the music of our artists. There's a lot of really great stuff on there. So um, that you can download from Google Play or the App Store. And I've got a link to either of those right now that I've just shared with you as well. Um, and then other than that, we've got a lot of other events going on this week, a lot of other live webinars. Tomorrow there's one with Stephen Wick, uh, Stephen Mead, Aaron Tyndall, and Dan D'Souza, who's also on this meeting. Um, and we're gonna be discussing mouthpiece design as all of them have been involved with, um, with mouthpiece design with Dennis Wick. Um, so I've got one last link to share with you and that's to get to our events page where you can find out what other events are happening this week. And then I'm going to step out of the way here and I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Wick, who is going to um, introduce everybody or, or begin the introductions and then we'll jump into some questions. So off to you, Stephen. Okay, thanks very much, Mary, and thank you for organizing this uh, so well. So um, if I just go around the group and uh, what I'll do is I'll ask everybody just to introduce themselves and tell us about your main gig and what kind of uh, playing you, you do and uh, of course what instrument you play and so on. So I think probably, should we start in the treble first and start with the trumpets? So Tim, do you want to tell us about yourself? It's very nice to talk about yourself, isn't it? Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I've been a professional trumpet player. My first job when I was 18 in 1973, so you can do the maths. Um, I'm a very old man. I, I've, up until the COVID struck, I've been lucky enough to be very busy. Uh, I've been involved with brass groups, orchestras, ballet, opera, all on the straight side of things. My main claim to fame is the fact that I did Les Miserables in London for 34 years. So um, I I managed to maintain my sanity by doing all my other sort of freelance gigs around it. And I guess across time, I've done most things that are illegal to do with the trumpet in my hand. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Joe, you're, you're up next. <laughs> Joe, you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Steve. Um, yes, trumpet player as well. Um, great to be here. Um, I'm a member of Bella Tromba, which is Dennis Wick Chamber Group, and um, I love chamber music, really passionate about developing opportunities um, to play trumpet in different settings. And I, I do obviously do orchestral work as well, um, Welsh National Opera, Britain Symphonia, um, Thunder Mozart players, bits and pieces here and there, and um, the quartet as well uh, does the education work at the Royal Opera House. 
Great, thank you. And um, let's go over to you, Baron. We're very lucky to ha have uh, Baron here. He's a very busy composer and busy player and busy doing so many things, aren't you, Baron? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trying to keep up with it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm Byron, um, a composer, trumpet player. Um, I really love um, all aspects of the of music. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in, in uh, traditional music as well. Um, I run a gamelan ensemble and I also do um, traditional uh, African music ensembles. Um, so, you know, normally I've, been, I've just been uh, promoting a new album uh, with my band, um, which uh, obviously had to stop because of the COVID thing. But I've been using my time really well in terms of um, writing lots of new music and getting into the piccolo. <laughs> so you know just learning new things and um connecting with students and uh you know lots of, lots of teaching and stuff like that so yeah mm -hmm. great to be here oh well it's great to have you and uh yeah i want to ask you about some of the community things you've been doing mm. it sounds so, so so interesting yeah um brian uh, how do, i'll explain brian's not from london he's actually an imposter He's from Chicago, but you're very welcome to join us here, Ron. Tell us about yourself. Uh, yeah, i am uh, been in Chicago for a long time. Uh, classical side of things, uh, in the last five or ten years, I kind of got into the broke trumpet scene, uh, which is a whole other scene. Um, but like in the last year before COVID, I started doing a lot of film score recording um, in the Chicago, which is kind of new. Um, so yeah, other than the chamber music is where I kind of got my start in in Chicago with the Gaudete Brass commissioning a lot of new works for the ensemble. So I'm glad to be in the group here, even though uh, I'm in Chicago. So nice to meet all of you. Good, yeah, thanks very much, Ryan. Now we're very lucky. We've got two of London's uh, best horn players here. So let's go over to them. So uh, Letty, do you want to tell us about yourself first? Yeah, sure. We're in a bit of a minority here, I think, but um, it's really <laughs> nice to be here. Um, I'm Letty and I do kind of a big mixture of things really. So before COVID um, struck, I did a lot of um, theatre stuff, some shows, um, quite a lot of education and community work, um, which I really enjoy. Um, and then kind of since since everything's gone a bit haywire um, over here in London, I've been really lucky to be an artist in residence and um, been exploring unusual types of horn, kind of going back in time a bit um, and doing some stuff on music and archaeology. Um, you can just about see one of them behind me here um, where I'm at home. Um, so that's been really nice. That's been a really creative project to be able to work on. And I know I'm probably not alone in feeling that creativity has been something that's a bit hard to find um, in the last few months. So it's been really great, great to have something to work on. Cool. You, you play, or do you still play, or you used to play in a street, one of those wacky street bands, didn't you? Huh? I still do the wacky street <laughs> band. Yeah, I'm in a band called Perhaps Contraption, which is um, pretty much the most fun I've ever had playing music. It's really good fun. And yeah, we dress up in costume and dance around and sing and stuff. So unfortunately, we would have been doing all the big festivals like Glastonbury last year, but um, hopefully this year some more stuff will, will come through. Yeah, fingers crossed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, over to you. <laughs> Hi everyone, nice to be here. Um, I'm a freelance horn player in London. I do, kind of similar to Letty, lots and lots of different things. So I do um, lots of natural horn and baroque horn and some education work to do with that as well. I'm a teacher. Um, so yeah, throughout the COVID situation, just been carrying on my teaching online. Um, and another thing I do is I've worked for the past 10 years for Pax Musical Instruments, which is a horn making company based in London. Um, so if you ever ring them looking for a Dennis Wick mouthpiece, you might speak to me. Um, so I yeah, help customers uh, choose horns, I test horns. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, some of what I do. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're working our way down the cliff, so getting into uh, Tenor Cliff. We have our friends from um, Slive Action, so um, shall we start with um, Benny and Jamie? Hello, um, I'm Benny, this is Jamie. Um, we agreed that I would talk because we're both living in the same flat. Um, yeah, we've been, we're from the quartet Slide Action. Um, We've been dancing artists for like a, a couple of years now. Um, 
but yeah no we're just all, we're all freelancers apart from josh who um who has a job with the rpo that's based on moon but um yeah we're all just in london we're hugh hugh is currently in um in wales where he's where he's from but we usually live in london um and work for a variety of different orchestras and um we've been in a quartet for a, for a few years now um starting to pick up stuff with that doing different competitions and um yeah trying to keep busy in london obviously at the moment quite difficult but um yeah just trying to yeah hopefully when things get going again everyone will be busy again but yeah that's us yeah yeah well i know um you know slide action you were so um successful uh, when he went to idea from won the um quartet competition against some um yeah some very hot competition there so um yeah congratulations on that so hugh <laughs> i i know you you were try. I think last time we spoke, you were when you were on trial for various jobs, and uh, I suppose that all came to a, a grinding halt. Huh? Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, hi, Graham. Nice to see you too. Um, that's correct, Steve. I was actually on trial for principal of CBSO, which is Graham's orchestra, a couple of years ago, and also with Scottish Ballet, Scottish Ballet Orchestra, um, which is funny enough. I feel a bit of an imposter at the moment because. I know this is a London hangout, but I'm actually locked down in Glasgow at the moment uh, with the other half, but um, I'm still there in spirit. So, um, yeah, I'm also a freelancer. Um, moved to London in 2015. And, um, yeah, I've just been freelancing away with mostly orchestral work for the past five years. And glad to have met Josh, Jamie and Benny studying at the Royal Academy of Music, where we formed Slide Action. And we're very grateful, Mary, that you allowed us to rehearse in your studios in Chicago when we did that ITF competition. Made that clinching difference to win that competition, I think. So thank you. <laughs> I take full responsibility for that win. Yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Josh, uh, good to see you. You've actually been playing. Uh, I mean, the orchestra's been working a little bit in lockdown, hasn't it? Yeah, hey everyone. Um, I'm Josh, and yeah, so um, I'm one quarter of Slide Action, and um, also um, my day job is based on where the RPO, along with Matt Knight, who is um, somewhere in this gallery view. Um, and yeah, so we've we've actually been very very fortunate that the the orchestra's been doing bits and bobs, um, which I'm sure Matt will tell you about as well. Um, not much in the way of audience related concerts, but lots of recordings and things like that. Um, so we're very fortunate and just um, hoping that we can start spreading it back to the um, the freelancers and stuff that we really rely on so much, you know, so, um, <clears throat> but yeah, very fortunate so far. Good, yeah. So Matt, I think last time we saw each other was in San Antonio in Texas when you were there with um, Septura for Texas Music Educators. Yeah, almost a year ago, which seems unbelievable because uh, a year in which nothing happens is weird thing for time, it seems. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm, my name's Matt, I'm a, a co-principal trombone in the RPO, um, and I also uh, play in and run a group called Septura. We were at TMEA uh, last year and um, had a great time um, there seeing Steve. Um, and uh, I also teach at the Royal College of Music. Um, so at least that has been ongoing uh, during COVID times. Uh, although at the moment it's over Zoom again, which is a bit of a shame, but hopefully a month or so we'll be back to in-person teaching, which would be good. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Yeah. Well, Harry, uh, tell us all about what, what you're doing. Hi, my name is Harry Brown. I play trombone. Um, like a few other people here do, um, well, I'm primarily known as jazz and commercial trombone player, but I do orchestral playing. And a few of us study at the academy, not at the same time. But I was there with um, Dudley Bright at the academy and a few other people as well. I think I met Matt once um, at Jules Holland's session many years ago. It's nice to see his face again. Um, but my primary gigs at the moment, um, before COVID, were Rudimental, Dance Group and um, Jazz Jamaica. I also play in the Trinique Orchestra as well and various other reggae, soul, ska reggae bands as well. Ooh. And... Um... Emma, shall we come to you? Because um, it com always confuses me because you're in a trumpet group, but you're not actually a trumpet player. I'm a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emma Bassett. I am a trombonist um, and a bass trumpet player um, in uh, Bella Trumba uh, Trumpet Quartet. Um, 
so I I do um, classical and commercial. Um, my job for the last three years has been um, the trombone player on the West End show, Everybody's Talking About Jamie, um, which we're hopefully going to, well, we went back for five days over December and then the new strain of Corona came back. So we were one of the first theatres to go back, which we were really lucky. Um, and I tour with... Um, um, as well as doing orchestral freelancing, I tour with artists such as um, Tim Minchin and um, people like Bastille, Adele um, and that type of thing. And um, hopefully we the, are supposed to be doing some tours um, with Tim Minchin. Hopefully it's going to go happen in October. It's rebooked for April. Then it's got to be rebooked for October. So we're all just waiting to see um, if we're allowed to go um, go back to that. Cool, cool, yeah. Well, working our way down to the um, bass clef, let's come to uh, the tuba players here. So, um, Ed, shall we start with you? <laughs> sure. Uh, hi, my name is Ed Ashby. I play tuba and sousaphone in a variety of settings. Uh, I studied at Trinity with Emma, so we kind of uh, grew up together doing that. And uh, most of the stuff I do, like I said, is jazz and commercial. I play with a band called the Hackney Colliery Band, which are like a modern day brass group, um, mostly sort of jazz based. Um, and uh, we were lucky enough to do a small version of that band on a show last year at the Globe for Midsummer Night's Dream, where I know Andy was working and Richard as well. And hopefully we're going to go back in and do it again this summer, but everything's uh, getting delayed, as everybody here will be aware of. So, uh, okay. and the same as Emma, hoping to tour with various ensembles and continue to do festivals, etc. As I'm sure all of you are in the same boat. But yeah, I've used lockdown to to get my my home recording setup perfected, and have been doing some recordings uh, over this period, which I'm seeing as a a good thing. Cool. Yeah, it's always good to learn something new, isn't it? Yeah. Richard, I'm so sorry. I, we got out of order here. I haven't included you in Mike's the Tremont Players. Apologies. Uh, <laughs> it's this gallery view. It's too confusing for me. Well, m m maybe you've seen me moonlighting as a tuba player occasionally. I have. I have. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm not giving you yet, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm Richard, Richard Henry, and I'm a bass trombonist, and uh, um, I've had the fortunate pleasure of playing with Steve, actually, on many, many a film session um, in days gone by. And uh, also, whilst Tim Hawes has been in one show for 30 years, I think I might have done 30 shows, I don't know, but uh, uh, they, they, they always last about six months or something like that. But anyway, uh, there you go. But uh, I, I'm mainly, uh, well, I'm a freelance uh, musician, as I, as I said, and uh, I, I cross over from jazz um, to, to to commercial work um, and uh, and theatre work. Um, I was mainly or mainly known for my work uh, with the Colibri Big Band. I was in that band for about maybe ten years or so. Also, George Russell, uh, an icon amongst jazz uh, musicians and writers, and in fact, with Byron, we were we've had a three day. Um, uh, Zoom session at Trinity College uh, discussing his life and works. Um, so I played in George's band, the Living Time Orchestra, for about eight years as well. Um, I also, um, as Ed was just saying, and, and Andy, uh, uh, work at the uh, Shakespeare Globe Theatre. I've been doing that for, I don't know, another 10, 12 years. I've been a, an MD there on a few occasions, and it's a great place to work, and it's, a, it's also great... Um, for musicians because they really do bring the musicians up front as well so if you get the opportunity anybody um please take it because it's, it's a great place to work and uh i guess in lockdown i've had a couple of gigs actually i'm not not bragging but i'm just very fortunate to have done that but uh during lockdown i i teach at trinity Laban. i've been doing that for like three years now and uh so you know, like everybody else, we've been doing a bit of online teaching. Um, I did my first academic class uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was quite difficult seeing a, a, a screen of blank, you know, 16 blank screens and no interaction. So my teacher training quickly kicked in and, uh, you know, so you work out ways to kind of deal with that. But I teach trombone there at Trinity Laban and I also uh, uh, run 
one of the three big bands there, mainly with the first and second years. We sort of do repertoire, big band stuff. And uh, so that's me. Um, my name's not Jack, it's Richard. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Andy, uh, Andy Kershaw, you um, you work at the Globe because I've seen you doing a show there. I saw you doing um, Mary Wands of Windsor, which was great. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, lovely to be along with so many friendly faces. Um, obviously, one of the things that uh, quite a few of us are missing through COVID is, is interaction, and this is as good as it gets. So hello. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a freelance tuba player, um, but I've got a, a really strong interest in early music performance on period instruments, mainly from the 19th century. Um, I've worked at putting a, a decent collection of instruments that can be played so that people can get an idea of what they might have sounded like uh, 150 years ago. And, and of course, in the UK, we've got a really amazing tradition of brass bands, um, which wouldn't exist if it hadn't have been for the sort of innovation of the, uh, the, the musical instrument industrial revolution, as I sort of see it. Um, but when I'm not dressed as a Victorian playing an Ophiclide, I, I, I do some other theatre shows, uh, as, as a couple of the guys have said at the Globe, and also a, a touring theatre show we're hoping is going to carry on with, with Benny uh, down at the bottom of my screen there. We should have been in South Africa last year, and we're hoping that happens later this year, but who knows. Um, and during the lockdown, I've been experimenting with trying to get some uh, concerts recorded that we've been uh, crowdfunding to um, give to, uh, for free to anyone in um, care homes or who is self-isolating. So that's that's a new new line for us. So thanks yeah. very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah. So Hala, great to see you. And uh, like um, Ed and Richard, you sort of your work on the tuba spans classical and jazz, doesn't it? Yeah. So hi guys. Um, mm -hmm. I'm Hala. Um, yeah, I kind of move between the classical world and kind of improvised stuff and jazz where I can. Um, I am part of a 10 piece jazz ensemble called Steve Ensemble. Um, I also play with Chineke Orchestra, where I've been lucky to play with Richard and Harry a number of times. Um, yeah, a couple of other things, some kind of commercial horn section work where that happens. I played with um, artists like Solange and Nadine Lee um, and that kind of thing. Um, and aside from that, I'm currently studying for a postgrad at the Royal College of Music. And yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks, Anna. thanks. Yeah. So Graham, coming to you, we've been in learning each other a few years and uh, you, you're in one of the, the best offices in the country, the, the CBSO. Um, Anything well, happening there at the moment? Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, it's lovely to see everyone, and, and thanks for the intro, Steve. I was actually starting to feel rather inadequate from all the things <laughs> that I'd heard. You know, all these people sort of crossing genres and all the rest of it. I felt rather straight laced. Um, you know, sort of. Um, for you know, some people here know me, some people don't. Um, but my, I'm, I'm Graham Sibley. I'm the principal tuber of the uh, City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. I'm also the tuba player for BCMG and I teach at the Royal Birmingham, Conserva Birmingham Conservatoire as well, so I'll keep my teeth in. <laughs> um, and But prior to taking up my job in Birmingham uh, in 2008, I freelanced in London for 18 years, so um, uh, I, I also feel quite old in, amongst the present company as well. Um, so I, so I, I, I feel slightly embarrassed about being in the company in, in the sense that um, I'm out of London now, but I did actually freelance in London for 18 years, even though I appreciate the scene right now is, is very different and very difficult for everyone. Um, in those days, I worked with you know pretty much all the London orchestras. Um, my sort of gig, as it were, um, around about that was Northern Ballet. So I used to sort of hot foot from one end of the country to the other doing that. Um, I also taught at Junior Guildhall and also at Christ Hospital School as well. So, um, you know, it, it was a busy old time, um, very varied, um, very interesting, but um, I, I was very glad to be off offered the opportunity to move up to Birmingham and join the orchestra um, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it ever since. Cool, thank you so much, yeah. I mean, one thing which might be explaining to anybody who's not from London is just the 
the way London orchestras work, which is it's different from the way your orchestra works, Graham, and uh, definitely different from the way all the American orchestras work, because um, Josh, maybe I could ask you to describe it. I mean, it's basically like a festival contract, isn't it? Well, the London orchestras compared to the kind of um, regional and BBC orchestras, yeah. Um, yeah, for those that don't know, basically the, the London four um, bands that aren't the BBC or the theatres of the opera houses um, are all essentially paid per service. So we have kind of a contract which uh, we are entitled to the work as and when it comes in, but um, <clears throat> we sort of, it's uh, positives and negatives. We work around um, our own schedule, essentially. We only have to do a certain percentage of the work that's offered. Um, whereas in a salaried orchestra, you have more of a guarantee of the number that you'll receive each year. Um, so I, I think there's pros and cons to both systems, to be honest, um, and both yeah, very different to the USA system. Um, I hope that sort of makes sense. I think uh, in, in uh, lockdowns, it's there are probably more pros to the uh, salaried system in reality <laughs> but it's also worth saying that we are um we so we're self-employed but we're also shareholders in our orchestra so the, the musicians in the orchestras actually own the orchestra and we have a, a player majority on the board so we kind of run the orchestra as well uh, and then employ management um uh, professional management to do the day-to-day -day work oh yeah that's that's interesting to know um i suppose that this kind of uh, having it um, the way it is, it, it's always worked because there's always been so much music in London. So um, uh, if you're not doing your orchestra, you, you will pretty much always guarantee to pick up film sessions or record sessions or, or theater gigs or, or whatever. So um, we're very lucky that in London is, well, I think of London as more than a national capital. It's almost like a kind of, international capital and uh, there's so much music which always happened in London uh, but um, it was always a great scene for freelancing I, I think it's probably still good but, but I think probably a little bit less good than it was uh, you know 30 or 40 years ago I don't know if anybody else has got thoughts about that that was actually going to be my first question for everyone and I'm going to gear it towards maybe Graham and Stephen or those of you who have been around the scene for a while is, you know, what would, what was it like when you entered the scene, you know, years ago and how do you see it changing or has it changed at all? Um, which Stephen, you kind of, you, you let in there, but um, I, I don't know who wants to take it from there. Yeah, I mean, I started, uh, I think probably even before, before Tim, I was sort of working in the, yeah, you know, certainly started doing movie sessions in about 1975 or something. And um, it was a really busy scene then. Um, there was so much recording work. There were often at least three orchestras just recording commercial music going simultaneously in any one day. And that hardly, I think that would happen these days. You know, uh, you're lucky if there's one orchestra uh, doing recording. But um, yeah, I, I think it was, there was definitely more more commercial work going in those days. But I mean, maybe it's still there, but just in a, in a different form. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, maybe um, maybe one of the younger players could advise me on that. Uh, I, I mean, Hannah, you, you, you must see lots of uh, different aspects of work, which is, you know, all the commercial work still happening, recordings and, you know, you know sessions. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, super varied. I'm so sorry. I actually was having some trouble with my iPad just then, so I didn't quite catch what you were saying. What was that, Steve? I'm just saying that I'm, I'm sure there is commercial work out there, but it, it probably just takes a, a different form these days from the, the old it, kind of pop sessions where they used to get an orchestra in to play the backing tracks and you just all go home again. <laughs> Yeah, completely. There, are, yeah, you're you're so right. There is work. It does kind of take some nosing about to find. I think I've been lucky enough to have. Um, I when I was younger, I came up through a program called Tomorrow's Warriors, um, which is a lot a lot of the kind of current UK jazz resurgence people um, 
I was kind of contemporaries with them there. So um, through kind of, I through collaborations with people that I met in that kind of scene, um, there are often links to um, loads of different kind of cross genre things that are happening right now. So like I did a session recently-ish um, at Made of Vale, which was a collaboration between Moses Boyd, who's a drummer, um, and three like grime MCs who wanted a live horn section um, to kind of freestyle over um, and things like that. Yeah, so there are really cool things going on. Um, did anybody else have anything to say on that? Or I have another question. Well, I think Do you mind if I jump in there on that one? Could, could I, it's Richard here. Could I jump in on, on the question of the uh, freelance scene? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I look at it in a positive way. I, I do think that uh, there is a, a, a good freelance scene. There is a good session scene. I'm not saying that because um, everybody's getting loads and loads of work. I think it kind of works a little bit different. I think I was at the period when, you know, you know, I wasn't there in 75, obviously, but certainly I do remember the times that, it, you know, there were busy days, you know, where you would get uh, CTS going at Wembley, which is not there anymore, you, you know, Lansdowne, there'd be studios working all over and, and it was, you know, big, big business. And that kind of stuff still goes on. Um, maybe it's less people, maybe some of the big orchestras are involved now, the Philharmonia, et cetera, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But what I'm finding is, is that, uh, as Hannah was suggesting there, you know, we, we get old, you know, as players, some, some of us get old, obviously. And, and I think the younger people, there are things happening and they're doing it their way. I think the old way was like there was a fixer and you'd be on their books or you weren't on their books. Nowadays, you know, we've got the internet. Um, people are able to do things much more direct and... So there are lots of little networks that we probably don't all know about. We're probably all party to say two or three different networks and they might intersect here and there. But if you're not part of a certain network, you're not quite sure. But that said, you know, as I say, I think there are people are working, but not quite in the same way. There is some, there is some big stuff. I mean, one of the weird things about this time since March, well, obviously we had the first lockdown here and then it kind of opened up a bit and from about, I don't know, July-ish, uh, the studios were allowed to open and, and do a bit of recording, but it's been really difficult because there's been loads of um, distancing um, and I don't think, as far as I know, they, they haven't had a, a, a full orchestra in and the two big studios still in London are Air Studios and Abbey Road and I think they can get a full orchestra using the two different studios each place. But I mean, there's, there, there has been some big stuff going on and there's a load of um, Netflix stuff that came out quite recently that was all done, I think, post lockdown in London. So things like the new series of The Crown, um, there's a George Clooney film called The Midnight Sky, um, The Trial of Chicago 7, all of those. So th there's you know, quite big net Netflix productions that were all done in London, but they were just done in this very weird way. And at the moment, recording is one of the few things that kind of, I think still is going on a bit, but weirdly, because there are really only those two big studios and it now takes so much longer to record an orchestra because you can't fit it all in the same room at the same time. The studio space is really a bit of a problem. You know, um, you guys are talking about all these studios that used to exist that I, you know, before my time, like CTS and stuff. And now it's a real shame that we don't have them because it's actually we're actually short of studio space at the moment. I think that's an issue in Hollywood as well. Actually, uh, a lot of the um, old studios have been converted into condos and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I was talking to uh, Doug Tornquist, who's a friend of mine, who's a Hollywood tubifer, and um, he he told me that he he did a movie recently where they were sent. All, all the files uh, and had to record their own tracks at home in their living rooms. And they used to remail all their individual tracks in and it's put together to create the, the movie uh, score, you know. So um, uh, I think there's more and more of that happening where people are just 
trying to gain their own contribution. Yeah. We lost you, Stephen. Were, were you continuing on? Sorry, I, I, I think Byron was trying to say something. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, over the years, I've found that the the scene has, you know, this it's it's become um, well for the for the stuff that I've been doing, which is more kind of soloist stuff and um, you know layering things and um, sound design stuff. It's it's a lot. It's been a lot more um, localized in the sense of, you know, people are are, are looking to do um, like you know for us to record our own things. So I've got a studio at, in my house, so I've kind of been recording mostly there. Whereas before, you know, it was more a situation of going into air or going into you know every road or having more the big things. But whereas now it's more like, oh, can you do this and they just send me the tracks, you know. So I think that's um, obviously being in London still is great because it, you know you have that connection and people are coming in and, and you know and, and you're having that kind of um, dialogue. But the, the actual studio space is actually now much more going into the smaller spaces, and um, I'm I'm seeing that as well. Like production companies having their own little studio spaces and you know and facilitating um, recordings within that. Um, over the years, it seems to be more and more going that way. Yeah, you know, we, we actually have another webinar happening on Friday with one of our artists, Quinn Carson. I met Quinn Carson at NAMM a couple of years ago, and he was recording for a HBO show called Drunk History. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but he'd record the horn lines for that. And he would, he's also was touring with a band and he would have to tour, he, he would have to record music for that program. It was, um, I don't remember how many years, but he would actually sometimes be recording out of the van that they were touring. And so he had to get really creative about how he was going to build a studio. And we've seen that. I mean, we talked about that quite a bit in the LA scene meetup last night that um, people are just having to record at home a lot more. So anyway, tomorrow on Friday afternoon, if you go to our event section um, that I shared the link with, we're actually doing a whole uh, webinar about that, you know, kind of how to record at home. And it's not just recording, you know, the kitschy recording tips. It's now your job could depend, you know, your next job could depend on how professionally you, you record yourself. And, you know, it's not just the recording process. It's, you know, how are you labeling the information? How are you organizing the information? So the person who has to use it has the easiest time to input it into whatever they're using. And there's a lot that goes into it now that we're not thinking about. Um, but on that note, um, in terms of how the scene is changing, for those of you who have just entered the scene, um, and this is more for our younger panel or younger attendees who are listening, when you want to enter the scene, what's it like now? I mean, do you kind of need a connection to the scene? Or for those of you who started working in London and you had connections, did it matter that you had the connections? Or do you feel like you, you everybody kind of has to start from the same ground zero point and work their way out? So I guess the first question is, you know, how do you how do you introduce yourself into the scene? And, you know, what kind of tools, what kind of skills do you need to kind of be successful in starting your career in the London scene? Um, I can maybe say something about that. I know that when I first arrived in London, one of the biggest helps was um, actually social media. I think uh, so many of those sort of really small, like small, I don't know, uh, choral society or your local amateur orchestra gigs will be organized over like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. And actually it's really easy for them to find young players who are willing just to go and do it for not too much money or um or quickly or for free even if they're if that's what they're, they're looking for and it, stuff like that is just a really good way to meet other musicians because you turn up and there's somebody just like you at a different music college or who lives nearby who then you connect with and they get you on the next thing so actually for starting out i think um it is very useful to use that resource obviously once um it sort of has its limits and once you get out of music college and that sort of speed or you don't want to take those kind of gigs anymore then it can die away but certainly um it makes you feel like you're doing something and, and helps you get along to start with i think i'd just like add to what jamie's saying i think that's all like spot on um and you know through the colleges these days we often um have loads of different sessions on professional development and this whole thing of 
developing a portfolio career, which is definitely really important, especially proving itself now more than ever. Um, it's good to have several different income streams and whether that's um, musical related or not, you know, um, no one's judging these days. And I think it's, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you do have little side things that aren't necessarily musical. But um, I think one thing I used to get really frustrated with at music colleges is we used to have all these professional development sessions about doing your CV and how to act and blah, blah, blah. And um, <clears throat> for those of you who know that the Academy had a bit of a, um, an instance a few years ago that was in the press um, with a professional development tutor. Um, and it's all fine now and whatever, but um, it, it all focused around the fact that the emphasis of this teaching wasn't on just being the best player that you can be. It was all about these little um, kind of satellite things around the side of it that were kind of, yes, this is really important. You need to know how to act and, and be part of the profession, but at the heart of it, we do just need to be the best we can be, I think. And um, certainly for me, that's um, something that I'm always working on, you know, now more than ever. Um, it's just trying to get better because, you know, people only want to sit next to you and listen to you if you sound good, don't they? Um, so you can have all the various bits of, um, you know, media and promo that you want, but if it doesn't sound great, no one's going to book you. Um, so, sorry, that sounds a bit harsh, but um, I think it's kind of the way things work really, isn't it? So, um, yeah. <laughs> I just thought I'd say a little bit like what Josh was saying about the portfolio career. Um, I think I was really lucky that I went to Trinity for my undergraduate and went to Academy for my master's, which I couldn't say were two more different colleges um, in how they um, approach, I think, work and teaching and things. And both great um, at Trinity. A lot of my, um, I graduated from Academy in 2015. And a lot of my, I feel like, um, orchestral experience a lot of that did come from the academy lots of my teachers gave me work luckily there was lots of um auditions when I left the academy and I managed to get trials and that's how I built up my orchestral career but at Trinity um I did a lot of doing like with Ed um I did um, Hackney Colliery Band you meet all these people but a lot of the reason I'm on a West End show at the moment you don't do an audition for a West End show I can go and do an audition for an orchestra if I'm good enough they'll give me a next audition I'll get you might get a trial I love it when you have a screened um thing and it's I, I think that's great for orchestras but in a West End show, I've never done, a, I never depped on a West End show. I'm a bit of a fraud when I first went, everyone's like, so what other shows have you done? I was like, I've never done a show before, got a seat on a show. But that's because the MD was at Trinity and I used to do loads of free recording for him. He had to choose his band and he was like, I'd like you to come in. So it's, I think it's a lot of doing um, lots of being in um around everyone he used to do jazz nights i used to love going to that just being going out and going out and just watching gigs going to do we over lockdown i've been um at ronnie scott's with um i play a guy called matt roberts big band we have done quite a lot of stuff over lockdown because of that these are all contacts that i made out of trinity of just going to watch people's gigs and having a really good time and then people just get to know you like that so I think there's there is a lot and that's two very different experiences one was very much taught you become you do become the best player you can be and you go and audition and hopefully you get a job but actually the other side of it is a bit more brutal because there's not auditions so even if you are the best player for a West End show you might never meet those people um so which is really hard so you've just got to make sure that you do go when when you are at college and stuff and, and after college, go to those gigs, meet the people, have a really like good time and yeah, listen to me and hope just and just get to know people. Um, and yeah, I think it's very two different ways of getting work, um, but that, that's what you've got to do to get work these days. <laughs> Emma, what you were saying made me think of uh, something a musician in one of our previous webinars said, you know, we always, in a lot of the webinars that we've had, we focused on, you know, you need to stay, you need to, like you're saying, you need to go out and do lots of things and you need to stay consistent. You need to be consistently yourself, consistently be good, you know, not try to be something different for each gig because then people never really get to know you. But on the same sense, you know, the more you go out and volunteer and the more different types of gigs you play, you might have a really bad gig or a really great gig. And the music, this musician said, there's a thousand different versions of yourself walking around every day because on one gig, you might've had a really bad day and that's the impression that one person had of you, you know, for that day and you don't see them again, so that's you. And then the next day you might've had the most amazing gig you've ever played in your life. And there's this amazing rock star, you know, musician walking around now. And, you know, and, and how do you deal with that as a freelancing musician when you are 
racking up the, you know, you played in f 10 different places in three different days. And now there's, you know, this many different versions of you walking around. How do you handle the good days and the bad days? And how do I think really hard as a, sorry, I think it's really hard sometimes as a freelancer, especially when you go into an orchestra, especially if you're on tour, you want to have fun. And sometimes you're really tired. You're going around China for three weeks and you're really, but you're like, well, I can't be grumpy today because they won't, they don't want grumpy Emma coming to sit in the orchestra. I think that is really tough, but you can't keep that up all the time. Um, I think just the thing is, you've just got to be yourself. I think it's, it's hard. Like when I'm, um, especially in the, in the show, cause it's, um, you have lots of, um, depths that come in, that come and sit next to you. And sometimes I just want to sit there. I just want to, when I'm not on, read my book and, but they want to chat. And sometimes you're like, oh, I feel, that I don't want that person to think I'm being really rude. And it is, it is really hard, but at the end of the day, you just got to be yourself and um, yeah, hope that, because ev everyone's having those days. No one's always happy all the time. Um, so if you are tired and stuff, you've just got that. Yeah, you just got to also just in focus really on, don't focus on what your personality is, just focus on playing and ho hopefully you won't mess up. <laughs> Maybe if that's so important. Little, little something for that. Um, in the West End, um, it was quite common for me to get emails from young players saying, hi, this is what I've done. Would you mind if I came and sat in on your show? Which for people who don't know what that means, um, somebody will come and sit next to you while you perform the show. They may come in two or three times to see how it works. And then if it's somebody you know who's playing, you know, um, you give them the opportunity to go in and do it for themselves and hopefully they'll they'll do a good job and they'll be on the list. Sadly it's fairly brutal as well. Um, the MDs in the West End are very quick to come and say sorry that guy's done two shows now and it's not perfect so don't want to see him anymore and it can be as brutal as that but it's, it's another way of getting in just to email the, the, the seat holder of a, a show if there's something that you want to, you know, do. Um, I never minded anybody approaching me saying, can I come and sit in? I would rarely say no. I may say to them, listen, I've got a, a long list of depths at the moment, but if you want to come in and just be added to it anyway, uh, that's fine. I'm not promising any work. Um, so that's it. I think- Can I, uh, sorry, so I talked over somebody, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that I think all the, all the uh, you know, relatively young players this week, so far, Benny, Jamie, Hugh, Emma, and even, even Josh, they're, they're all quite modest, and, and they've all come in the, in the RPO um, whilst I've been there. The thing is, they're all absolutely superb musicians and um, able to adjust to the way we play, and I think that's the thing. The London orchestras do have different styles and different ways of working. And there's also, particularly in our orchestra, um, not very much rehearsal time. So we often will do a concert just on three hour rehearsal um, of repertoire that we kind of, you know, we know very well. Um, and it's difficult when you're stopping out because you often might be playing the stuff for the first time. Um, but the difference between the players who don't come in again, perhaps, and, and the ones like these guys who then become very regulars or in Josh's case um, actually get a job in the orchestra is that they, they kind of really adapt and, and just fit right into that section straight away um, so that's so important. What Matt just said is something that I was going to allude to as well is that um, it, it, I think it's being a great musician as well as being a great player and that adaptability um, and certainly the the, um, the the people on this call that teach at conservatoires I was very lucky to have Steve uh, and, and Graham uh, as two of my professors um, and I know that obviously Matt and others teach at conservatoires as well I think if, if you can encourage people to find a love for as many styles of music as possible I mean you're not going to love everything um, but but I really quite liked um, some some types of jazz I'm not I'm not confident or decent and I won't improvise but suddenly one of my first breaks out of the academy um, was was sort of with about five hours notice to go and sit in on on the West End show Chicago, 
um, which for those of you that don't know the show, the band is on stage. So no sit in as Emma and Tim described, you're literally on stage. You can be seen by the, the, uh, the, um, by the uh, audience. So it, it went in, the, the, uh, I was sent some music a few months before because I had asked if I could go on the debt list and something had happened, somebody had gone sick. And uh, I did have a pad, which I just had time to look at and the, and the, the screen goes up and you're on. And uh, as uh, Tim pointed out, it can be quite brutal, but for those two and a half hours, three hours, you're sort of on maximum attack and you're thinking, how can I fit in as one of these guys? And that, that was just one of the ways that it, it worked out for me. And without Graham and Steve supporting a love for other music, like early music or, you know, figure out how to enjoy jazz or how, how it fits together, then that wouldn't have happened. I'm sure that ability to fit in is exactly the same in the uh, jazz world. Um, do, do you find that, Harry? Yeah, definitely. It's all about, as, you, as the others were saying, about blending with a section and having ears, really. That's the most important thing. We all can be a great player, but if you don't listen, everyone thinks, oh, he, he's nailed that great, plays all the lines, but he's not blending with the spirit of the music, which is the most important thing. I agree with what you said, Steve, and everyone else. And I'll see Byron nod his head, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I think also alluding to the, the other question you had, Mary, I mean, I think, you know, when you're playing music, it's for me, it's it's such a sacred thing to do, you know, and it's like, you know, the great Art Blake, he always said, you know, music washes the, you know, is washes away the dust of everyday life. And it's like when you hit that, when you hit that, um, you know, you, you, hit, you hit the stage, it's it's a it's a place of 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 joy you know it's really a place of that you can actually transcend all the stuff that's happening in your you know personal life or anything and and in that sense you know the, the musicians who you're playing with are are really important as well and together you create something that then you know transcends that thing so i think as, as a musician um it, you know musicians who have that sensibility of of coming to you know, of, of, of really giving and um, being a part of the ensemble that they are, you know, not only in playing the notes, but in the energy and the attitude that they bring to the stage. Um, those musicians will always do well because people will will see that they're, they're bringing something to the table that is um, needed. I agree with that, Byron, because I remember my first ever gig was with you. And you did so well, Harry. <laughs> We're still working together. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but yeah, you know, because it's, it's that thing of, of, of we're doing this together. And, and you know, I think that the audience really captures that. They, 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 when, when everyone is on, the, on that same page, it really then, you know, allows things to take off. I think this is a great opportunity because it goes along with what you guys are talking about. But one of our attendees had a really good question, um, which I'm going to pull up here. I just need to unmute myself. There we go. Um, are there any per pervasive myths in the brass playing world that you think need to be called out? So this could be, you know, in terms of brass playing, I was thinking maybe even in your, you know, in the freelancing or in the, uh, in your jobbing world. Um, but anything that you feel like when maybe you were younger, you were burdened with, and now you realize it's completely untrue or, or in terms of what makes you successful or unsuccessful. Can I put a hand up? Yeah. I think one of the most dangerous things for a brass player is to believe you've got to be perfect. And I think it's um, that if you happen to be a conscientious soul, as I was, um, to fear that you wouldn't get your next gig because you had to be perfect um, was a, a, an awful pressure to bear. Um, and I think, you know, Mistakes are a part of what we do as brass players, um, and they're inescapable. Um, but to be to live in fear of them, I think, is a terrible thing. And I think you just need to just let go and be yourself, as all these other guys have said. And it's been fascinating to hear all that they've said. That it's you know, be yourself, you know, and that includes warts and all. And if in the end it isn't good enough, it isn't good enough. But nine times out of ten it will be. I think you've got to be uh, conscientious about what you do but not to beat yourself up too much about it. Um, 
maybe I've been too forgiving in my time with myself, but um, you have got to forgive yourself, otherwise you drive yourself mad. I remember doing a, a performance um, many, many years ago with a certain very well-known trumpet player, and he'd been playing the Haydn trumpet concerto, and to be honest, it hadn't gone very, very well at all. And afterwards in the pub, he was very, very depressed about it. And um, people were trying to G him along and say, well, this bit was really good. Oh, well, yes, I suppose it was. And, and that bit was great at the end. And yeah, well, I, I suppose it didn't go too badly. By the end of the, his first pint, it was probably the best performance he'd ever given. So <laughs> um, you've got to be a bit forgiven with yourself. Whilst trying the best, of course. Yeah, well, that's a nice story, too. Yeah, yeah. Graham, I, I, I'm in total agreement with you, and I think some of the, you know, the best times I've had on stage seven with orchestras is listening to people playing with such abandon. Who and they, it's like they don't, they're going to get it right, but they don't. They're really going for it. I love that, and especially, I remember, you know, sitting in the same section as Morris Murphy sometimes, and and I'm sure you you did too, and. You know that guy would just sort of go for it, and you know, and it was so thrilling. And also, you always knew you had a tiny bit in reserve as well. You know, it's you know, it was it was, yeah, uh, I, I love that. I think with Morris, I, I, and I was fortunate enough to work with Morris on quite a few occasions, and I've, I've known Morris or I knew Morris from the nineteen seventies. Uh, he would say that he wasn't a great teacher because he was such a natural player he really didn't know how he did it but he was so inherently musical I've sat next to him when he's had the what would appear to be the simplest thing in the world to play five straight crutches and he turns it to gold every time he just had this musicianship about him so look for the music I, I read somewhere recently about a trumpet player who was having problems and he'd he'd, he'd Done the thing that we all go do. He changed his instruments. He changed his mouthpieces. He went to all the teachers in the world and until one teacher said to him, well, "Forget about all that. Where's the music in what you're trying to do?" And he said, "From the moment that the, that uh, particular person said that to him, it all kind of fell into place." I think if there's one myth that I would want to debunk, it's it is probably the idea of fitting in. And um, I get that it's you know, really important to support your colleagues and, and be a part of a section and listen to what's going on around you. And that's, you know, musicianship and it's a skill that um, we all, you know, constantly trying to develop and learn from each other all the time. Um, but the idea that any of us would fit in, in all the, the difference is, is, is nonsense. You know, what makes Morris Murphy remarkable is that he's well, Morris Murphy and, you know, he's an individual. So I, I don't think, any of us would be able to fit in in every scenario. And the more you try and do that, the more you weaken who you are as an, as an artist. So um, I would say, stay true to yourself. And if you're good at something, maybe even if it's something someone else points out to you, hang on to that and develop that. Let that seed grow and see where it leads. Um, and don't let anybody um, tell you you can't do it either. Because there's a lot of people, especially if you are good at something, there will always be people who will want to kind of crap all over it so um you know stick with it if there's something you love and it's just growing and it's not quite there yet just keep building it because um i mean when you're on your deathbed and dying you don't want to be looking back at all the things you could have done <laughs> you want to be thinking well actually at least i had a go and i tried it and I, and I stuck with it and i think that's more important than trying to fit in and be a a copy of something that's been and gone before because you, you'll never be as good as that particular role model anyway you can only ever be yourself are there are there any horn myths letty and dan i mean uh... sorry um, steve say, say that question again would you are there any horn myths uh, or you know uh, <laughs> uh, 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 we mean, keep those keep those a secret <laughs> <laughs> I mean, horn um, sections always seem incredibly collaborative to me. I mean, I was always amazed, especially on sessions, you know, you get four horn players or eight horn players turning up and they all blend absolutely perfectly. They just sound like when they're playing in unison, they sound like, you know, one, you know, just one entity. It, it is incredible how, how you guys do it. 
Well, I suppose a lot of it, um, I agree with a lot of things that have been said um, by, by people here. I think it's, it is at the same time important to be able to kind of blend and be part of a homogenous section and also, as Joe was saying, to be your own person. And I suppose as horn players, perhaps especially, um, you've got to be work as a very efficient team from the get go. Um, but I think I think what's so lovely to me coming out of all this conversation is that the importance of being a very strong musician and being true to yourself and also being a nice person to sit next to um, is, is just so important. And something that, you know, we are all brass players. We're part of this community. We've everyone's split notes before um, and everyone is trying, is striving for kind of excellence in every gig that they do. I think it's that sense of kind of teamwork and just knowing that that, you know, if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world, but also that people have got your back. Um, and I think the nicest thing about working in an ensemble that I think all of us have been missing so much is, is that sense of teamwork and building something to, together that is better than just one of us by ourselves. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's that, that sense of kind of, you're all working together for this kind of, this, this goal um, as a shared goal um, and something that is, that is truly, beautiful um, and creative and lovely and kind of you know it elevates us as as humans um, I think that's probably what we're, we're all missing <laughs> um, and what we're all kind of going for as as artists um, in our own right doesn't I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> I was just going to say about another myth um not necessarily a myth, but um, something that kind of probably needs to be mentioned that people are worried about going into profession is um, all the like drinking. If you're not comfortable with drinking and um, if you don't feel like you want to, it's like the section of going out for a drink and you feel like you have to join in. Um, I think always just do the thing that you feel most comfortable with whilst being able to play the best you possibly can play. I think like don't feel like you have to show off and like have a drink and join in with all the guys. Remember that, it's, that they've got the job and they know what they're comfortable with and what they can do with the playing and all that and just do whatever you can possibly do to make sure you can play your best whilst also you know being a nice guy I think you can always go with them to have a drink but if you don't feel like you want to have a drink just don't have don't have an alcoholic drink and um just don't be weird about it <laughs> um and just don't yeah just don't be stressed about it I think a lot of people are worried about that um yeah, I think good, advice, yeah. Benny. good advice <laughs> there we go. yeah is that still a pressure, you know, for people who are like just kind of coming out of college now, is that still something that you feel under pressure to sort of go for a drink and, you know, before the show, is that still a culture that's out there? Uh, it's probably hanging on a little bit, um, but certainly from, obviously not having really experienced it firsthand, but from the stories that get passed down, it feels like perhaps it's dying out. Um, but then again, that's just, uh, I, I feel like uh, um, I, I hear this a lot, but people say that the standard of brass playing in, in this country is steadily increasing. So sort of the, the younger generations, I know that there are some incredibly good young players coming up underneath me and Benny and um, are going to take everybody by storm probably. But um, there's sort of a more of an emphasis on, as we've been all saying, that the music and being the absolute best that you can be. And it's with that, the, you know, drinking however many pints before a gig doesn't really fly anymore. I think the standard of brass playing is phenomenal in this country now, uh, compared to perhaps Steve, when we were starting off in the, you know, back in the day, uh, I've been massively impressed with the, the, the kids that came through my, I taught at the uh, Junior Academy uh, between 2000 and 2010 and the standard was unbelievable really young people like uh, I taught young Ryan Linham and um, he could always do everything before he uh, finished his first term uh, I think I've always been massively impressed with not only the playing but the approach to the business in every aspect you've got you young people I'm I'm a you know an old man now. I'm, I'm a technophobe. Um, I'm not very comfortable with a lot of te technical stuff. But you guys, my son, he's or the two sons, one's 29, one's 22. Um, you're all over the technical stuff. The world is completely yours. You've got the, the recording 
um, technique and capabilities that you understand what you're doing in a way that I struggle with. Um, and I think the technology for the recording is, as you were saying earlier, that doing it from home is the way forward. And I think as soon as they can synchronize um, recordings, I know it's impossible to play duets and things with somebody on um, uh, FaceTime or, or Skype or anything else at the moment or Zoom because of the delay. Once they've sorted that out, I think the whole business will take a, a, an about turn. And I think we will find ourselves doing complete sessions and films directly from home. That's interesting, uh, Tim. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And I, I think I'm going to have to start teaching my students the difference between a ribbon mic and a condenser mic and stuff like that, you know, because that's going to be useful information for them in their, in their future careers. But um, I noticed certainly talking to our American artists, and I think Mary will back this up, um, a, a lot of them have really uh, transformed their careers by all the home recording. Um, you know, Arnetta Johnson, one of our, our trumpet artists, she's playing on dozens and dozens of tracks, but they're all recorded at, at, at home. You know, uh, artists send them files and she puts on the home tracks. And, uh, you know, there are people like a trombonist, Christopher Bell, who uh, really just through his sort of social media, YouTube, all that stuff that he records at home, he's created an entire living for himself without ever having to play in a band or, or orchestra, which is really phenomenally interesting and, and very enterprising of him as well. Yeah, you know, I think an interesting subject that's come up out of that, because that, that's that, that question has come up a lot in our American uh, the American artist group discussions is how much do we really need all this technology you know like because uh, a lot of the artists that have been already well established are saying you know I, I don't do social media I don't I've never had to record myself and I don't really see the need which isn't a bad thing either but I think where a lot of the where we see things going in terms of home recording and um, getting yourself up on social media it's taking ownership in a new way I think over the years with um, Spotify and you know recording artists, the ownership of your music is slowly being ripped away from you more and more, and the ownership of your career. I mean, from a marketing standpoint, the ownership of your marketing list. You know, if if you have this huge Facebook following, well, you really don't own that following. So you know, the more you know how to to promote yourself and to create your own community and be an ownership of that community, the more um, the more control you have over monetizing what you do. And I really feel like that's a push, that's, that's a, a very strong direction the future is going towards is artists are finding new ways to take ownership of making money and being paid for their music. And I think, you know, recording and social media is, is you know, is what we're seeing is the, the, the major road to doing that right now. Um, this actually is, leads into one of the last questions last and the general questions um, that we got from our, our, uh, our attendees, but um, what's the last thing you changed about, changed your opinion on when it comes to playing your instrument, your equipment, or your approach to making music? I will take a couple minutes on this, and then I want to get into some COVID-19 questions too, but anybody have any ideas? Can I just say something about, for that, um, over COVID, I was, um, when I came out of college, if I went a couple of days without playing, I'd be completely stressing. I'm going to lose my lip. I'll never, ever be able to play again. It's going to be absolutely horrendous. Um, and just the fear of taking time off. Um, and actually what I've learned over COVID is it comes back. <laughs> uh, I really, really struggled at the beginning of COVID. I, um, I had absolutely... I, been really lucky that since I left college I always had something to practice for even if it was in a couple of weeks or I'd never had the I never had to think what shall I practice today because there was always something to practice for or you would go and do a gig and you'd be playing and my brain just went I don't what am I supposed to do today and I think that's a big change is one because even when you're at college the whole time you're either practicing for a grade as a kid and then you go to music college and there's just always something to do and the big thing for me in COVID was learning how to change my practice to do it for me to say what do I actually want to practice what do I need to practice um, and actually take some time off and know that that is okay and actually now I think 
perhaps later on in my life, I might go on a holiday and not be worrying about coming back. And um, and I actually will go to practice because I know that when I do, do go back to it, I know I'll be really good in my practice and I'll get back to it and it does come back. Your lips do not fall off and you shouldn't just always be feel guilty about taking time off. Um, and I've never had that before. And I think COVID really taught me that you can, as long as you're obviously when you go back to it, you are very efficient in your practice and everything like that. But I think that was a really big thing in COVID that um, I ha hadn't done before. I think I'd agree with what Emma just said. I mean, uh, over COVID, I spent time actually sort of separating practice from playing the horn. So I, you know, made sure to, you know, when I did play the horn, either play it for just the joy of playing music and playing my instrument, or it was a sort of, little bit of sort of main chop maintenance type stuff but keeping those kind of separate in my head was quite useful so just playing some stuff I wanted to play even if it wasn't horn music you know just playing some uh, uh, tenor arias or something just you know stealing other music to play rather than thinking I must play some orchestral excerpts when really probably not that beneficial when we're still in lockdown um I think it's slightly related to um, what Emma said. I, I get, I, I have a kind of suspicion that partly because of the way we're paid and, and things like that, that most musicians working in London are sort of like workaholics. Um, I know that, uh, um, yeah, lots, lots of players who, you know, barely take a day off work. They're, they're just, you know, in the studio or in orchestras or doing whatever, just absolutely um, nailing it the whole time and I think maybe for some of us um, COVID has been a kind of good opportunity to sit back and, and, and realise that there might be more to life and other things to do and you know I certainly know that uh, I mean for me in, in 2019 I was on tour for 24 weeks um, and I don't want to do that again so I'm certainly going to be looking to change my working practices a little bit. You know, Matt, I'm, I'm sure that you're, you, what you say about working practices, I, I think our working practices are going to change after COVID. And I think people have realised that you don't need conductors and orchestras jetting all over the world to give concerts. And, um, uh, you know, things are going to take on a more kind of local aspect. So, um, so Byron, what you're doing, you know, with sort of local music and community music, I think will really come into focus in the coming years. Yeah. And it's also that thing of, of what music um, represents to a society as well. You know, I think that because uh, I do teaching at various levels, so from primary school to you know secondary schools and academies to um junior guild hall to you know uh conservatoires birmingham and trinity and uh guild hall and you know the thing that is 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 unified is that connection you know with the music and and the way that the the communities work so if you can get that situation where within schools you know you've got um uh, musicians who you know or, or children who want to do music and they're given a platform to do it and then there's a there's a a path to, that they can take you know so it becomes something that they can perform out or something that they some kind of goal that they have um which which actually incorporates the the institution as well and then connecting that with other elements so whether that's with a venue or whether that's with a with um some kind of funding scheme or something you know connecting the, the different parts of what music making is I think that's that's what really what I've been trying to do um, like for instance coming out of lockdown I'm organizing um, uh, one of the things I think that's broken down is that, you know that whole kind of people not feeling safe to go outside not feeling safe to do things in a community and so I'm hoping to get this gamelan workshop which is going to be run at um, a local uh, theatre and uh, we, we're going to you know get families to come and we're going to be learning music within that within that construct 
I think uh, taking up on Byron's thing there about, uh, you know, doing things for, for music's sake that you really love, um, relating that to practice. Um, I think what lockdown, what, what lockdown has taught me, and this is what I would recommend, is um, to the focus that you want to actually um, tackle, you know, in your playing. I mean, I don't mean you're going to change the wheel or anything like that, but it, you know, it just might be what's one area or, or set yourself a target, you know, think because we are, because we are in lockdown and because, uh, you know, things are going to be different right now, let's say for the next six weeks or three weeks, you know, give yourself a little task to do with your playing. And it just kind of refocuses you that you're not thinking about what happens if I, when I turn up to a gig or my chops going to be okay, you know, but just enjoy the instrument for what it is for like when you actually first began to play an instrument, you know, just take that sort of feeling of the pleasure it gave you and actually just try and learn something new on your instrument or improve an area that you've been thinking about doing because now is the time. Now is the time to do that, you know, um, because Santa Claus will be watching you. <laughs> I just I was just building on that. There's there are often things that I, I felt that if there's a certain technique that you can't actually practice whilst fitting it into like a busy working life, if there's something that you know if you do a lot of that, it's gonna mess up your orchestral playing a bit. And it's been like a perfect time for me, I know, to work on certain things like that. Like, I don't know, learn like a crazy piece that you you know that you can never learn in normal life. Um, something you've always wanted to do. Like I, I learned the Berio sequence or something like you know, you could do something like that. And um, yeah, it's a good time, like you're saying, just to get really stuck in on something that you could never normally do. Yeah, tailing on that one, actually, I was feeling quite conscious in lockdown. It's quite dangerous, actually. It's always quite dangerous trying to train your own for sure, of course. But during lockdown, I had so much time to just mess around with things. So just trying to shift things around, it kind of felt a bit dangerous. So I was always kind of conscious to try and just focus on the music, do what you love. And that's why it took me some time to find out, just realise that. Everyone's got a different embouchure, different things work for different people. So I thought there's no point thinking about it too much. So just try to keep a straight head and get back on it. I just wanted to mention one small thing. We were um, talking about how it's rubbish on Zoom. You can't either play with other musicians in time or teach students and play along with them because of the delay. Um, Trevor Myers, who was on the call, but I think he had to go dash off with his uh, kids, um, has been talking to me about uh, not a new thing, but a thing that's new to him called Jam Kazam, which is a, a program on a computer. Some of you guys might know it, um, where you can play live in sync with, with other musicians online. Um, and you can either set up like a backing track and then play along with it together or it's, or just play just the two of you. It, it requires quite a lot of tech stuff. You have to plug your computer in with a cable, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that might be worth checking out if anybody's interested. Jam, Jam Kazam. Yeah, and then there's some other ones. There's a, there's a Jamulus as well, which is, but then that's a, a kind of relies on the server. So you've got to have it go into the same server and you've got to have a good um, uh, audio interface and then there's clean feed as well clean feed is good and sometimes if you can use combinations like clean feed for the audio and then maybe zoom for the you know for the for the video contact can work can work well with two or three or four people I find it, it more than that it can get a bit more <laughs> But, but um, just on that, Byron and, and uh, Ed, I mean, I've looked at those and I'm right in thinking, though, you, you do need to um, to have a good sense of technical, you know, the gubbings of your computer, i.e. looking at that stuff that nobody wants to look at. So in case you are yeah. thinking of trying that. Well, um, I mean, it's not, it's not a lot of not a lot of work, really. It's just you need yeah. a decent audio interface and a decent mic. So, and then a, a good stable um, internet connection. If you've got okay. those three things. So it's not, it's not that difficult. I'm just thinking for like the, the, the younger um, yeah. audiences watching us now, you know, is it, um, do you think it's something they could do by themselves or it's gonna be an adult or, or whatever? Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, 
it depends what they want to do. I mean, if you if they just want to play with their friends, it's possible. You know, if if obviously if they, or one on one to one teaching is is very easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know if they wanted to do some um, orchestral um, parts, then <laughs> that's probably more difficult. But you know, in terms of just two or three or four people, I think you can. Do Got to it. do a self help video, Byron or, or Ed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well we're getting close to the hour and a half mark and i want to make sure we get into the future of what we see now one of our uh attendees asked about um where where are the best places to visit or groups to see live or maybe sit in with if you're trying to slowly make your way into the london freelance scene as a brass player so keeping that in mind you can answer that but um where do you think as we start opening up where do you think those places will open? Where do you think people are going to go first? How do you see the opening up happening? I see see it opening up very slowly and in very small um, performances. Uh, uh, you know, the fewest number of people that can be um, involved as possible. Uh, I know somebody whose job is rewriting you know, with Wagner operas for a, a, a side drama and a kazoo. And uh, he's rushed off his feet because everybody wants small, small, small and smaller. And I think unfortunately as brass players, especially particularly on the, the classical side, the straight side, where we might make our, our money appearing on, in stage bands and th- all the rest of it. I think the days of those performances taking off again, that are a long way in the future because the orchestras have been decimated financially. Um, and I think the lower brass are gonna suffer. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong and maybe Matt or Andy's got something to say on that. But um, it seems to be that a lot of the orchestras are putting on very small pieces with you know two trumpets, uh, no trombones, no tubers. Uh, it's, it's a little bit depressing. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm afraid to say that I am, um... I, I agree with Tim. I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about how it's going to open up. Um, you know, obviously in this country, there's all this kind of thing about maybe things might beginning begin to open up in the middle of February. Uh, but I think for uh, certainly the low brass end of things, it's going to be a lot longer than that. I, I don't think, um, I'm not sure we'll ever go back to exactly the way we were working, as Steve said. But I'm not. Sh- I'm, I think it's also going to take a very long time for us to get back to the same level of uh, of work. Um, I think certainly not before the autumn, really, in a in a big way. And especially for it's it, it's maybe different for different orchestras. But for an orchestra like the RPO, um, a lot of our work and a lot of the orchestra's income is from engagements. So it's from promoters, either in this country or abroad, actually booking the orchestra. Um, and there is a huge uh, amount, because there's been so much uncertainty, um, there's a lot of nervousness amongst those promoters. Uh, it's gonna take a long time for the confidence to come back. And that, that filters through to smaller groups, that, you know, we see it with Sectura as well, um, things being put back um, by years. Um, so I think it's gonna take a very long time, basically. And, and all these kind of things where people are doing other stuff and doing chain music and, and recording from home and, and things like that, those, those, are, those are great. Um, and hopefully they'll keep everyone, um, everyone going. I mean, the, with the, the home recording thing and, and working from home, which I'm sure will become much more of what we do and, and we will learn how to do it properly and everything. Um, but I mean, I hope it doesn't take over everything because I think for a lot of us, um, you know, playing music with other people is what we really got in this to 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 do, and and uh, making those kind of connections musically and and also socially. You know, it's a it's a social business, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to when we kind of get back to it properly. But I think it could be a long time. So from um, what you're, what you're saying, Matt. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, from what you're saying, uh, I'm I'm sure there will be an appetite for live music, but maybe this is a fantastic opportunity for groups like Septura and Bella Tromba and Queen Victoria Consort and so on. Yeah, I mean, on, on, a, on a slightly more optimistic um, footing, there's definitely is an appetite. I mean, the, the RPO had um, uh, 11 concerts lined up at the Albert Hall for, for Christmas, 
uh, which were all sold out. So there was still an appetite for people to come, but then it all got uh, cancelled, of course. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's a question. Also, the, the sooner we can get rid of distancing, uh, the better, because that's a real killer. If you, if you can only get half or a third of an audience in, it kills it for the, for the promoters. Um, but, you know, that seems like we, we're already told that this, we may have to live with distancing into next autumn and things like that. So it's, it's uh, really a, a difficult problem to see the way out of. I totally agree with that. I just wanted to throw maybe just a couple of slightly, hopefully more um, optimistic things into the mix, which are, that I know that, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. Um, I know that there have been concert venues that have been trying to get round this. And um, Steve Sterling, another brilliant horn player, um, he's been looking at um, the Academy of St. Martin in the field, looking at what they can do. Obviously they are still a chamber orchestra. Um, I did a gig at the Wigmore Hall um, last week and they have been doing, ad admittedly at the moment, streaming their, their performances and admittedly it is still chamber. But there's, there's, there's venues that are looking at how to, how to manage this. But um, I think personally, um, I know this is probably gonna be a very unpopular suggestion. Um, we can do stuff that's outdoors. And I think, I mean, my street band <laughs> is obviously something that, that plays outdoors, but I've done a lot of theater that is, uh, is outdoor theater, the Globe, you know, Regent's Park um, Theater. We've got these open spaces um, in London. Our weather is notoriously atrocious. Um, so, you know, good luck tourists for sitting through um, outdoor shows. But at least kind of maybe one way to look at it in a positive slant is that as brass players, we are able to play outdoors, whereas the strings are kind of hiding their violins under <laughs> as many canopies as possible. So I don't know, personally, I hope that venues will approach all the challenges of distancing, having fewer people in their audiences. I hope that they will see that as a challenge and look at ways that they can respond to that. And maybe as brass players, we just have to get used to being a bit a bit soggy um, for our gigs uh, in the future. Yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the jazz side, um, I mean, there's a lot of venues in London that have really you know, really bent over backwards to accommodate the, the scene. Um, I did a gig at Ronnie's Scott's just before the second lockdown. And, you know, they've really, they've really kind of gone to great expense to, to f make the, you know, make the audience feel really safe. They've got um, panels. Um, there's like a distance between the, the band and the, and the, and the, and the tables. Um, then they're doing a situation whereby people don't, they don't, you know, they don't go for their drinks. Every, everything, ever the waiters come to them and um, they order everything. And it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's safer to be in, in, the, in there than it would be in Waitrose or Sainsbury's, <laughs> you know, really. And, and, and then, then you've got the 606, which was done a similar thing in uh, Chelsea. Um... And then I think the Vortex are doing things like that as well to, to, to try and make it so that we can come back to, to, to playing. Obviously, this is in smaller bands and smaller areas. I mean, some of them, like the Vortex, are only doing maximum trios. So, you know, everyone's got a, a duet, a trio project now. <laughs> so that's what's going to be happening. And then you've got the situation of, um, you know, doing things outside, which is what you were saying. Which is, which is a which I think is a great thing anyway, you know, because it's, it's obviously the thing that's difficult is is the revenue situation. I mean, there's always going to be possibility to do gigs, but it's it's whether it the gig will actually pay enough for people to to go out and do it, you know. And then uh, on top of the COVID thing, we've also got the Brexit situation, which uh, no one's mentioned, but already, you know, all my summer gigs in in Europe have been cancelled mm -hmm. because of COVID and Brexit. So. It's good to be positive, but we've got to keep our eyes open. Cheer up, uh, cheer up Byron. Huh? Cheer up. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. I have a, I have a small, uh, small, again, glimmer of hope. I was lucky enough in September to do a week of gigs. Um, it was socially distanced, and what, the way it worked was they had seven different bands on in the evening. Oh, one night records. Yeah. Who? Oh, Harry. Yeah, yeah. You, you did some of those, didn't you? Yeah. 
Yeah, and actually that way of working, just to explain what it was, there's like seven different bands in seven different sort of rooms and then the audience were in small groups and would go around and listen to the band for 15 minutes and they'd just get seven different 15 minute little slots and it was distanced and um, you're in small groups and that might be like the future of how the industry starts to go in some of these completely innovative uh, and different I've never played in that type of thing before it was really weird and I'm sure Harry you'd agree it's a strange thing to do but amazing and cathartic to be able to play safely and they were employing a bunch of musicians and rotating the um the lineup every week as well so um that was that might be the way that we see things going and i, I don't know it doesn't work for all genres and all gigs and all bands but people are trying and that again was was really well attended people are desperate to go and see live music again i think getting the people out there to watch it is not going to be a problem it's whether we can do it and it make money, but that, they seem to be doing all right with that one. Ed, I'd be really um, interested to to hear uh, if you know how how the funding with that worked, because obviously you're employing, even though you've got full audiences, which is great, you're you're employing a large number of musicians. And my worry is a bit linked to what Matt was saying: is that um, promoters? I mean, my my I had a big tour in. Um, July right to the end of July cancelled because a it was going to Poland with the Brexit stuff was on the on the cards uh, and b because it's a it's a large orchestra and a large choir and they just couldn't fund it unless the concerts were going to be full um, and I mean I have to say without naming names but I'm sure you can do the detective work a particularly well known well regarded uh, London theatre impresario that employs a, a number of us or has done. It's been very, very vocal about how much support he wants to give people. But actually what he's not doing is putting on shows to empty theatres and putting them out on the streaming service because it doesn't make him any money. And that's the sheer fact of it, is that if he wanted to help people, he should be putting the show out uh, anyway. There was um, a, a COVID secure show, uh, Sleepless, um, which I don't know if anyone saw or was involved with the band, um, which went out during the first lockdown. Uh, and the guy took the hit, the, the guy who owned the right to the uh, show took the hit of having everybody um, tested before each show each day, socially distanced backstage and all the audience members tested uh, for temperatures and everything before going in. And he lost money on the show, but he made sure it happened. And it might take a few people doing that for a short time to get stuff up and running. I don't know. I think the way this one worked was the ticket prices were really high. And despite that, they managed to fill, they managed to fill it out pretty well. And I think there are portions of society that just aren't spending any money and are able to save. I've got friends who have day jobs that they're just fine and are saving money. So that when the chance to support the arts does come along, that's what they want to do. And that's where they want to put their expendable income, which we should all be telling them to do. But that, I think that's how that project worked. It sounds like what a lot of you are saying is we're not concerned about the desire for people to come and support hearing our music. We're concerned about the people who are organizing the music, creating opportunities to make that music. Um, and if that's the case, how, how do you feel like, um, Byron, you were talking about a project you were working on for, I think, a little bit ago um, for one thing start opening up are, are there any projects that are that you're getting inspired to do as you have the opportunity to think to play for people again that you think you know i'll just i'll just create this for myself mm. 